has been a, it has been a while. I was looking forward to this event. Um, I, I was like hoping to be uh, uh, like the first event of us going back to uh, to being uh, to attending in person um, next time. Um, I am in New York actually, so I'm calling from my hotel. That's why you have like this is weird light. Like as hotel lights are never uh, are never great. So look, I, I put together a couple of like um, a couple of charts here uh, for you today. I think it's my first like brand innovators presentation uh, uh, on my new job. I moved from uh, Burger King to Activision Blizzard around six months ago. I was always like a, a big, big fan uh, of gaming since I was a kid. Uh, and when the opportunity came uh, to work uh, on this industry, I, I could not say no. You know, like I have had like amazing seven, a little bit over seven years uh, of like a, such a great experience at like a, at Burger King. It was not even just Burger King. We also had like Popeyes and Tim Hortons that was RBI. Um, I, I'm, I feel very fortunate to have left like a, a, a very strong team uh, working there. So we are going to continue to see some cool stuff coming from those folks. But now I have my, my new journey six months in uh, uh, on video game. Uh, and it's kind of funny because when I told my friends, uh, when I told my friends I was making the move, like uh, they were like, oh, that's really exciting. Da, da, da. They know that I, they knew that I always liked video games to start with. So it felt very natural. Uh, but it's funny because like they were like asking me like, well, how, do I, how do I see the industry? How do I, I think about the industry? And then I came to realize that uh, at least on my circle of friends, like uh, and, and even though people are like uh, in the industry or like uh, working uh, marketing, some work in advertising, people don't realize how big and how evolved uh, the industry is in terms of gaming. You know, like I tend to tell people, uh, to ask my friends, like, what do you think is bigger? Do you think gaming is bigger or do you think the music industry is bigger? And they're like, of course music is bigger. And I ask them, like, what do you think is bigger? Do you think like movies uh, is bigger or do you think gaming is bigger? And it's like, of course movies is bigger. And in reality is gaming is actually larger than movies and uh, and music together uh, by a large, like large uh, 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 chunk. Uh, so let me see if I can project my slides. Um, I was struggling a little bit earlier today. So maybe, maybe you, you guys can confirm that you can see uh, the slide. Uh, someone maybe from the Brain Innovator team can like, just give me like a head nod. Uh, in case you, you can see, oh, someone is talking to me on the chat. That's helpful too. Let me see if I can open the chat here. Yes, you can see the slides. That's awesome. Let me see how do I close the chat now. Uh, yeah, I did. Cool. So gaming is bigger than you think. And uh, let me see if I can pass the slide. Yes, well, I mean, I will show you some videos that will have a little bit of violence, a little bit of blood. I hope that we don't have too many people fa uh, faint of heart uh, uh, on, in here. Uh, intro I already did. Uh, this is what I was talking about. You know, you have an industry that's growing a lot and evolving a lot. Uh, and I think that most people don't even realize uh, that that's the case. So I will, this presentation has kind of like two parts. I will talk a little bit about the industry to kind of like use some misconceptions around gaming, which I thought would be helpful for you guys. And then I will talk a little bit about some of the stuff uh, that we are doing. So the industry is huge, like everyone plays. And by the way, I will talk about that in a second. Like today, there is no such thing as more like gamers. Everyone is a gamer. Right, I mean, we have like 3.1 billion people playing games like uh, uh, worldwide, like in the US, three of four people play, like uh, it's, it's huge, 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 huge. Uh, just as an example, we launched Call of Duty Mobile uh, around two years ago now, right? I mean, um, 2020, 2021, yeah, two years ago, and we have like more than half a billion people who downloaded the game. Um, not only that, like Candy Crush is also from um, um, Activision Blizzard King. Candy Crush has 4.3 billion uh, downloads uh, and has 255 million monthly active users. That's insane, you know, like, and I don't think people realize that Candy Crush is so big. You know, it's a machine, like uh, it's a company in itself, you know, in terms of revenue, in terms of the number of people working and in terms of like the, the number of people that we can engage on a daily basis. Uh, that's another one that I, I love. Like when I saw this for the first time, I was like, are you sure about the numbers? Uh, but yeah, like the numbers are right. Like uh, going back to my conversation with my friends around what do they think is bigger, right? I mean, 
uh, obviously, if I ask my friends, like, what do you think is bigger in terms of box office and in terms of sales, um, Call of Duty or Star Wars, they will say, oh, Star Wars is definitely much bigger. And then you see the difference between Call of Duty, Warcraft, which is also a franchise from Blizzard, from Activision, and Candy Crush. You know, like uh, those are like, it's like uh, the size of those franchises is something that like uh, um, maybe if you if I didn't work in the industry or maybe if I'm not so into gaming, I would not realize how big they are. Um, and, and, you know, like the size of the industry and the size of the franchises is just part of the story. You know, there is another part of the story which has to do with the engagement. You know, um, if you think about the number uh, of minutes or hours uh, that people spend uh, playing games uh, per day or per month and compare to other uh, social media platforms, you will quickly realize that gaming is actually probably like, I would say, I would dare to say like the largest social media platform, even though it's like, it's not apples to apples comparison, but it's where today people come to meet, you know, like the industry evolved a lot from when I was, when Fernando was a little kid playing Nintendo uh, by himself, playing Mario by himself. Uh, and then <clears throat> my mom would call me to have dinner. I would pause the game, go grab dinner and come back uh, and continue to play by myself or with a friend. Uh, today, people meet at those virtual spaces. Like uh, uh, if you think about Fortnite, if you think about Call of Duty Warzone, if you think about Warcraft, like uh, uh, I, I play, uh, Warzone, which is Call of Duty, with friends, you know, like uh, we meet there. Uh, and of course, like some of these numbers, they have been uh, accelerated throughout the pandemic, right? I mean, because it became a way for people to connect, but it was already growing before the pandemic and continues to grow, like now that we are easing out of the pandemic, hopefully. So uh, the pandemic, yeah, sure, accelerated some of those trends, but those trends were already there. You know, and people are already treating gaming as a social, uh, as social encounters. Gaming isn't just about playing games. It's also about watching them. And again, like, uh, I think that if you are not so into gaming, or if you are not working in this industry, you may not realize that, but the, the number of hours uh, that people watch live streaming or streaming of gaming on Twitch or YouTube gaming is enormous. You know, is more time than if you combine all the stream services together. You know, and again, I don't think everyone realizes that. You know, the global audience for live streaming of gaming is almost like it will reach soon enough a billion people. You know, you have more than 40 million active gaming channels on YouTube. You know, it's insane. You know, like, uh, and like I used to watch before uh, joining Activision Blizzard, you know, like, uh, and and it crosses ages, geographies, uh, gender. You know, it's a very diverse crowd uh, that's watching uh, gaming. Um, like thinking about that's something that I know lots of people are curious about, and I get usually like lots of questions around like esports. You know, like how big esports is, and my my misconception before working at Vision, I need to be honest, I thought that that it was growing, but still relatively small. But reality is, is that it's already massive, you know, especially if you compare the audience of esports with the audience of other sports. So it is and it's, it's going to still grow a lot, right? I mean, if you think about the number of hours uh, of streaming of people watching, if you think about the number of people that play the game, if you think about how many of these games are social and some people are becoming real celebrities in terms of being influencers in, in, in gaming. Uh, having 34 million uh, as an audience in 2019 already makes gaming in the US larger than Formula One, larger than MLS, you know, catching up with NHL. But soon enough, it will surpass most of this, if not all of this, uh, because it's really like the future. So there is an opportunity there too. And by the way, if you look at specific uh, age brackets and especially Gen Z, uh, you see that. Uh, 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 gaming becomes even more relevant, you know, like uh, I am, I am 40 plus and I play gaming and there are lots of people just like me, you know, like there are much older people who play gaming. Uh, but when you think about esports specifically, um, you can really reach an audience that's very hard to reach, which is Gen Z. Um, 
uh, by, uh, by tapping into opportunities around esports, around streaming, and around gaming. Um, gamers are everyone. I kind of like mentioned that like uh, uh, early on uh, in the presentation. Uh, and I think it's really important to understand this concept because I think that people still have like the misconception that gamers will be like a, a dude in the, uh, in the like locked in his room, uh, like in the dark, like uh, playing nonstop uh, video game. And I'm sure there are some people like that, but it's much more mainstream than that. You know, like the numbers would not be as large as the ones uh, I presented to you in the beginning if it were just that niche uh, 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 of people, yeah? And I love some of these stats, you know, like there are just as many people age 50 or older playing games than those under 18, you know, which may sound counterintuitive. And there are more women playing games than teenage boys. So the, whatever image you have of like how a gamer looks like, it's probably wrong because gamers are basically like everyone. Uh, so it's much more diverse in the range of age, the range of ethnicity, the range of geography, the range of anything you choose uh, is pretty broad. Um, game is more than about uh, winning. It's a place people uh, for people to connect meaningfully uh, with others. And they will talk a lot about that. You know, I kind of like touched on that before already, right? I mean, like I think about gaming as like almost like a social network. Like I meet up with friends in gaming. Uh, uh, it becomes a place to be uh, and to connect. Like if you're playing Warcraft, if you're playing Warzone, uh, if you're playing any of or any of the games that have kind of like a metaverse, you know uh, uh, what I'm talking about. Um, here are some numbers which I find like uh, really like uh, really interesting, right? I mean, uh, uh, the social uh, side of gaming um, is a big and growing attraction. Video game helps me connect with others with similar interests, you see how high the numbers are. Video games help me uh, to meet new people. Look at the numbers. Like a video game help me stay in touch with friends. So it's really not about isolating yourself. On the contrary, people are playing video game to connect. Um, so this is kind of like just in a nutshell because mainly because I don't have a lot of time uh, and I will probably go over time a little bit because I always screw up on time. Hopefully we can catch up because we have uh, a q a and a fireside chat just after so hopefully it will work out uh, just fine but just like a glimpse into like how what gaming is today how gaming is evolving and how maybe uh, uh maybe we still have some wrong misconceptions about uh about the industry then thinking about the work that we are trying to do here and of course i will i will if, i will touch back into like some of the trends and some of the things I just described, right? Before going into like projects and where we are trying to go from and to, like, I think it's important to understand what's the mission of Activision Blizzard King. Uh, if you don't know the company, it's basically like we have three business units. We have Activision, uh, main game for Activision is Call of Duty, uh, which is a first person shooter. Um, we also have uh, 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 other games like uh, uh, Tony Hawk, uh, we have Crash Bandicoot, like, but Activision, the biggest one uh, is Call of Duty. Then we have Blizzard. Uh, on Blizzard, we have games like World of Warcraft or Overwatch or Diablo. Um, and we have King that the, the biggest game is basically like Candy Crush. So we have a portfolio uh, uh, of brands, uh, of franchises. That's, how, uh, that's how, how we say it, right? And the mission uh, that we have as a company is to basically connect and engage the world through epic entertainment. You know, like, uh, so it, it, it goes back to what gaming is becoming, you know, like uh, it's connecting and engaging the world. Uh, like it's a social space. Um, and in terms of ambition, uh, we really want to capture the hearts and minds of 1 billion players. Uh, it, it, like think about the magnitude and the size uh, and the reach uh, that the franchises can have, right? I mean, I did show some of the numbers, Candy Crush 255 million, uh, monthly active users. Uh, in total, we are around 400, 500 uh, today. Those are like public numbers. If you look at our previous earnings calls, I think that they are there. Uh, and the ambition is to basically like double that. Um, so how are we going to do this, right? I mean, like, and, and thinking about where we are coming from, which is a good place, right? I mean, Activision, Blizzard King have been incredibly successful uh, 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 over time. 
but like surely because the industry is evolving, there are things that we can do even better. So like also looking at like a, where we are going to and, and, and trying to describe to you in a simple way in the limited time I have, like a, how we are tapping into some of the trends and some of the information that I presented to you first. So first thing is like moving from uh, uh, being like always like thinking about the, the sales cycles uh, to moving uh, at the speed of culture. Um, and this is like, and this is really important because the more um, uh, the more um, gaming becomes this portal uh, to uh, to a reality where people connect, uh, the more it will influence culture, right? And the more uh, uh, and the more you will have culture appearing uh, uh, in the game. So it's really important that uh, we we kind of like layer on top of the the work that we usually do and that's usually very successful additional things, right? So historically, if you go back like 10 years ago, the way uh, you would launch a game would be like, you would have like a one launch per year and you would launch almost as if it were like a, a theatrical release, like a movie, right? I mean, you would have a trailer, you would have like a poster, you have an accolades trailer with the reviews uh, and you would concentrate your money uh, on those six weeks around uh, uh, the launch of the movie. And then you would finish that and would start to work uh, on the title for, uh, for the next year. Now it's much more evolved than that. You know, now it's like always on. Uh, you can download content all the time. Like uh, you play live with your friends. Uh, sure, we still have like some big titles that come throughout the year, but, uh, uh, but like it, it doesn't stop. You know, I don't know how much you guys play. Uh, so maybe I'm explaining too much uh, for some, but for instance, Call of Duty, right? Call of Duty has two, like has two pillars or two ways that you can play. You can play Warzone, which is our free to play, uh, which is basically like a battle royale game where you parachute, 150 people parachute on this island, and then this battle royale, the last one that survives wins, or the last team that survives, the last squad that survives wins. Uh, and people go and play and, and play again and play again and play again. It's just fun. And then we have the premium title, which in this year is called Call of Duty Vanguard, uh, which usually has a story mode where you play a story. It's like watching a movie. Like my wife doesn't like playing Call of Duty, but she loves watching because it's really like watching a movie unfold in front of you. And then you have zombie mode and then you have multiplayer mode. You have like lots of things that come in that, that title. On the free to play, the way we monetize is like we sell skins, we sell operators, we sell guns. So people buy those things for their character so that they can play. And on the premium, you buy the title uh, and then like you have everything on that package. Um, but because I have Warzone, which is the free to play, uh, I need to, um, our mentality needs to be one where I am like throwing a party on Warzone all the time so that people are like engaged and coming back all the time. So we, we have to think about how do we evolve from that mindset of having one big launch per year to, to yes, I mean, we continue to have one big launch per year, but like, how can I be much more always on about the way uh, I communicate? And the way we're trying to do that, and I'll just show some examples here, uh, is like, a, we think about like, let's not, let's not stop doing what we know works well. You know, like that's really important. So we have the work that we call like the groundworks, which are the things that are proven to work. You know, it's like doing a trailer for the for the game when you're going to launch. Is like a, a, a showing gameplay uh, of the of the game because the players they they want to see the game, obviously, right? So we can do that better. We can always try to improve, but you have to do that. So here I brought one example. I hope it plays well. If like a. Uh, if the guys on the chat, if it doesn't play, if the sound doesn't play, let me know and I will see like uh, what's going on. But hopefully we play well. I will show to you the, um, the launch film of Diablo 2 Resurrected. Diablo 2 Resurrected is a classic game that we relaunched, like uh, we made it much better and relaunched like this year. It has been, uh, uh, it's, like a, it's like a game that there is like a, a really huge like a following base. Like people are, it's a very cult game. So this was basically like the, the launch spot, which we consider groundwork because we have to do it. We know it works. So let me play that one for you. Uh, 
Forgive me, brother, for I have never sinned. Then why do you seek forgiveness? Because I am overcome with temptation. I want to sin. I need to sin. What acts do you wish to commit? I want to loot corpses and defile tombs. I want to perform rituals and gain immeasurable power. I want to let greed guide me to untold riches. But most of all, I, <laughs> I want to bathe in the blood of demons. And why do you wish to do these things? There are signs of a second coming. I wasn't here for the first, but Diablo will be resurrected, and I want to face him. Doing evil against evil is not a sin. It's righteous. So I should go. Give in to your temptation. <laughs> So a very, very successful uh, product uh, with a campaign that does the groundwork really well. Now think about fireworks. Fireworks is like, okay, cool. Like uh, you, you cover your base, you're doing the right things. You, you're doing the things you know uh, work well. Um, how can we do things that go above and beyond, especially like the audience that we know it's captive to the game already. And we create things that will get talked about everywhere, even if you're not a gamer. You know, like, uh, so that's kind of like one of the challenges we have. Like, how can we expand the horizons of gaming uh, and do things that will capture even more players, like, or will grab the attention of people that may think that the game is not for them? Uh, and the example I have here is a, is a campaign that we're launching today, actually. So I was very happy that, like, uh, uh, that the keynote was on Thursday because I was dying to show this one. It's brand new. We launched it this morning. Uh, it's a campaign that we did for Call of Duty. Uh, for the Vanguard title that we are launching first week of November. And the thing is the technology is amazing uh, on these games. Like uh, we use something that's called photogrammetry, which basically like, scans the environments like one-to-one. -one. So when you are playing, it's a really immersive experience. It's very realistic. It's a game that happens on, in, during uh, World War II. And we are showing all fronts, not just like the battle uh, in, in Europe, for, uh, which is usually what's classic, classically uh, presented. Um, and we wanted to do something different, real, to show how amazing the graphics are without geeking out too much around the technology, uh, which maybe if you're not so into game, you will not be interested. So this is what we did, and I'll just play the video for you. In all the years that I've been covering conflict zones, I was in Afghanistan, Syria and Iraq. The first time I was at Lebanon in a city called Tripoli, I moved to Jordan. That was super shocking to me. I definitely think the Great Wars. World War II would be fascinating. I think that would be any journalist's dream. We've created a virtual camera. It's like a, a portal into the game engine. Not only does it transcend them into the game engine, but back in time as if they were a photographer there in the period. She camera. Thank you. I 
it felt like they were situations that I would normally capture. I was impressed how kinetic the game was because everything is actually happening and moving around you. It was really fascinating to be part of a type of battle that I've never been. This is what war looks like. This is what conflict looks like. This is it. This is real. So I, I, I need to be honest with you, I really love this campaign. Um, it's kind of like one of the reasons why I was so excited about coming and working on gaming, you know, like uh, you can blend technology, entertainment, uh, and if you add a layer uh, of creativity, you, you can do things that are like really amazing. And in this case, we are act actually auctioning like the, the images, like I have a partnership with like Blickr Trading. Uh, so they are signed by the photographer, it's a limited edition, and we donate the money to the, the Call of Duty Endowment Fund. We have the Call of Duty has the largest private endowment fund uh, in terms of like helping um, find high quality jobs to veterans. We are at the cusp uh, of reaching 100,000 uh, 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 job uh, pl placements uh, of veterans in high quality jobs. So it's also for, uh, for a good cause. Just a little plug here uh, of the Call of Duty Endowment Fund. And then we also have like what we call Evergreen, which are activities and communications that they don't necessarily link to a bit in the plan. They are things that we always have uh, to be doing. Just like on Burger King, like we always had to be talking about flame breathing. Like here, like for instance, uh, we know that one of the main reasons people stop playing Call of Duty, just as an example, is, uh, 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 is the, that, that when, when, they are, when they face a hacker or someone who's cheating uh, uh, on the game. So we are working constantly uh, to ban people who hack into the game or to cheat on the game. Um, and, and we need to constantly also communicate and advertise about these efforts uh, uh, that we are doing. So I, I, by the way, I strongly recommend that you do the same for your brand, no matter which category you're in, try to identify what are the triggers and barriers uh, and, maybe, and maybe put a brief uh, against some of that. And that's kind of like what we call uh, evergreen. And here's just like a, one example, which is a, a, an initiative, uh, anti-cheating uh, that we launched around like a week ago, 10 days ago, this was the post uh, uh, of the launch. I'm, I'm going to accelerate here, like, and not like go into much detail, but like just by doing this, uh, that we're seeing, this is probably, if not the highest, the, the post, the highest engagement that we had this year is definitely like top three, you know, like, so the community was really craving for us uh, to take action. Uh, and we're taking action and communicating accordingly. Um, Another from in two, and again, I'm going to accelerate a little bit here so that we can cover everything. Like it's thinking about ourselves, and I touched on that too, uh, not just as like a publisher of video games or like launching a movie, but being hosts of uh, virtual spaces, you know, like and thinking about what are the things we can do to truly entertain people and that they continue to come and come uh, often. I'm not going to play the whole clip here. Uh, but for instance, uh, just because of sake of time, and it's very easy to find on YouTube, but like uh, last year, we did a very cool and innovative and creative initiative around Halloween. Like uh, we brought some external IPs uh, to Warzone uh, and people could play with them. This year we are doing it again. Uh, and again, this is like a two minute film. I'll just play like uh, 30 seconds of it for you to get the picture. Uh, this guy, if you don't know him, he is like a, one of the top influencers uh, on the game. He's on Face Clan, um, and and this is, was basically like the announcement of our Halloween uh, event this year. Got him. Hello. What's your favorite place to drop? I think you got the wrong number, dude. I said, what's your favorite place to drop? Um, Superstore? Really? Then why are you in Graveyard right now? Who is this? The question isn't who am I. The question is, where am I? Oh. <laughs> 
I think you get the you get the spirit, right? <clears throat> but like this is again is a different way to think about gaming. Um, um, like it's not just like launching a box uh, once a year. Like it's like we have to constantly entertain uh, people and and bring people, uh, give a reason for people to come uh, and play all the time. Um, escape from community and a portal into the community. I love this. Uh, this is a quote from the New York Times. Like uh, at first we play video games because we were friends. Now we are friends because we played video games. Like uh, which is so true. You know, it's exactly the way I feel about uh, about it as a uh, as a consumer. And game is no longer viewed as escape from community as a portal into it. So it's very different than uh, the way it was before and the way, the way it was perceived before. To the point that this year we, we launched, and this is ongoing in the US at the moment, uh, we have a, a, a Candy Crush competition. You know what I mean? And again, Candy Crush is the typical game that people play by themselves. So when we organize a competition, we are, we are bringing people together. And we did that in a very, um, in a very like TikTok, very social media uh, uh, type of way. You know, we have Khloe Kardashian as the host of the competition. We have the different states competing. Uh, we invite a Doja Cat uh, to participate. You can see Gronk is also part of that. We have like lots of influencers participating. The finale is coming end of this month. So like uh, soon enough, we will see uh, who is the, the best crusher uh, in America. Uh, and again, like we, we do this because we see the trends that are uh, in the marketplace. I will skip the next one. Um, and then <clears throat> this is the last point, which I think is really cool, uh, is to think about game as a channel, not just game uh, as a product. You know, if you think about the number of people that come and, uh, uh, and, and play every day, uh, that play every month, you can really, and, and the fact that I can uh, basically like tailor content to them, Thinking about gaming as a channel is something that can be really powerful. Um, I have one example uh, uh, of that, and I'm not going to play the video, I'll just explain. Uh, but we were launching Call of Duty Vanguard, which is the premium game uh, from Call of Duty. And we have Warzone, which is the free to play, which has a massive audience. When you win, it's a battle royale game. So it's 150 people go in, one person survives. Usually when you die, you continue to watch to see who is going to win. And, uh, and we had, and when you win, a helicopter comes and rescues you, you know, and that's the ending uh, of that game. And, uh, and everyone is watching the winner, especially if it's a streamer. I mean, he's streaming uh, or she's streaming the, the victory. So a large audience. So what we did was we took one of the characters of the game that we haven't launched yet. So no one has seen her. Her name is Polina. She's a Russian sniper from World War II. She's coming on the new game that we haven't announced yet. And we had Paulina killing the person who won. When the person is going on the helicopter, Paulina appears and shoots the person. And the reaction of the community was like, what the fuck just happened here? You know, and we didn't do it in every game because we really want to mess up with people. So we did once every 250 games. So it wouldn't happen all the time. So people were like discussing what's happening. Like, did this happen to you? No, it did not. Like, why did it happen to me? It was totally random. Uh, but again, this is like using our own platform to announce uh, uh, a game that we are about to launch, uh, which I don't think we've done much of that uh, in the past. And then the last example, which again, I'm not going to play, is also something that we launched this week. We did a partnership with Jack White. Uh, he's, the, he's the lead guy on the White Stripes, basically. And uh, he was releasing a new single which is called Taking Me Back. And we did a partnership with him and release his new track uh, um, in, a, in a trailer for Call of Duty. Like when I was a kid, the musicians wanted to release new tracks on MTV. You know, like then, like maybe a couple of years ago, YouTube. Now we can use gaming as a channel to even release a track, a soundtrack. Uh, which is really, I think it will become more and more popular. We get a ton of coverage on this. And by the way, the track is awesome. So just to wrap it up, um, game is larger than you think. Like that's the beginning of the presentation. Gamers are everyone. Uh, there are no gamers anymore. Uh, it's almost like saying like uh, someone who watches a lot of TV, you are, you, 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 it doesn't define you, you know, like since everyone plays game and since everyone plays TV, it doesn't really define you. Um, gaming truly engages its audience, whether they are playing or just watching. Gaming is social, uh, and game absorbs and creates culture. 
Uh, and in order to unlock the opportunity for your brand, if you're not working on gaming and you want to partner uh, with, with games or do something around gaming, you need to really understand the game, understand the community of players, uh, and find like truly authentic ways to connect uh, and add value to those players. Like don't try to come and advertise because that's probably not going to work so well for you. And this is all I had. And I know I went a little bit over time. Apologies for that. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to catch up uh, with the Q&A uh, and the fireside chat. Thank you. Fernando, that was amazing. That Call of Duty technology was mind blowing, literally. <laughs> Serious, wow, Thank I've never you. seen I'm anything glad you like, like it. it. Yeah, um, but now we're gonna move on to the second half of your discussion for fireside chat. Um, joining us to the stage will be our moderator, Serge Mata, who's the president of LG Ads. And participants, please remember you can submit questions via the Q&A widget below. Uh, Serge, stage is yours. Yeah. You guys, thank you. Um, trying to get this going, I think so. You're coming. Hey, you hey how are you? How are you, Fernando? It's been a while. Good to see you, and congrats so on the uh, on the new job. Even though it's only it's been what six months, I'm sure six it feels months. six months in. Feels like six years, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, I, I lost sense of time and space a long time ago. Well, COVID does that to you too. Yeah. Um, but hey, uh, let's just uh, kick it off with a quick chat and also ask, and then uh, towards the end, we'll ask uh, the audience if they have any questions. But really, you know, you've been in the QSR world. Um, you were a CMO at for, uh, Burger King for folks that don't know. Um, impressive resume, impressive career. Can you give us a sense of the differences of how you see it now that you've been into the job for six months between CPG, QSR, and versus gaming? And yeah. uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts there? And what can you leverage from your past experience to bring on to uh, the gaming industry? Yeah, look, um, like I, I spent 18 years in Unilever. Uh, that's where I started my, my career. And, uh, and I never studied marketing before working for Unilever. Like I was studying mechanical engineering, believe it or not. And then, uh, uh, and then I got my job. I got a job first in the factory and then uh, as a marketeer. And all the foundation marketing that I've learned um, in Unilever, I still apply. You know what I mean? Like um, not only that, like uh, all like the, the basics, you know, like from the four Ps to knowing who Philip Kotler was and like... Uh, 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 and being consumer centric and, uh, and, and in the case of Unilever, um, doing things that will have a positive impact for people and society, this is all still relevant. I think that no matter which industry you are in, I think that moving to um, moving and, and in Unilever, I also had like, uh, I was fortunate enough to have like some amazing people that coached me and like uh, and helped me like improve my my, my criteria and all that in uh, in burger king uh, i think that the thing i've learned the most I, i've learned a lot uh in terms of design in terms of how to push the boundaries in creativity and what results that could produce um i think that the, the thing i've learned the most at burger king was more like less skill and more uh leadership um, you know, like lessons, you know, like uh, working with franchisees, working in an industry with people that didn't know me from before. It was like me getting out of my comfort zone of 18 years in Unilever and going to an environment that was like 3G capital. It was a very different culture uh, back then. Um, so I've learned a lot about myself and a lot about uh, how to influence an organization and all that, and which I think that the more mature you get, the more senior you get, the more you need that like uh, uh, to, uh, to make things um, happen. And then coming to, coming to um, uh, Activision Blizzard, like it, it was like a, a, always like a dream to work in technology entertainment. Um, I always like, if, if I always think like, if I am going to change, to make a change, I think it's much better to make a change for something that's completely different you know, like where I will learn much more than change by another company that's similar. You know, that was the reason why I moved from Unilever to Burger King and then moving from Burger King to Activision Blizzard. Like I'm learning so much, you know, like in terms of like growth marketing, performance marketing, in terms of like 
how to how to influence people in terms of like how to find ways to influence the game uh like the studio usually controls uh, uh, that part um and and bringing the knowledge that i had in terms of like what tends to work well when it comes to advertising doing things differently from from burger king and and, and doing the right thing and having positive social impact from unilever trying to bring all those things you know like it's always a combination it's always like learning being being humble about it and, and, and trying to use some of the things that worked or experiment with some of the things that work well for you uh, in the past in this new industry. Uh, and, and it's a good time to, to do that because it's an industry that's evolving so much, so fast that we need to experiment. You know, like uh, I think that Activision Blizzard has been a, an amazing success story, uh, but not necessarily all the things that made the company successful will continue to work with the same level of um, efficiency uh, as before. Oh, well, you're in the right category for sure. You, you could make the argument that gaming and connected TV are the two hottest things right now. So there's no, there's no doubt about it. I guess before we get into more into the gaming, but if you ex look at your time at Burger King, what do you think are the main learnings and what would you have done differently now that, you know, there's always, always sensitivity and, you know, I've worked in the industry for a long time, especially in the QSR world, um, corporate and how they, how they handle, for example, franchisees and the control that the franchisees have versus what corporate has and who ultimately has the power and how much change can you really impact um, in, in, in that kind of world. Um, what, what do you think you have, um, based on that experience, and then you can bring that on to, uh, to, um, to Activision? Um, I think like, I think I've learned a lot um, at Burger King about how to um, engage and bring um, the stakeholders with you in a journey. You know, like uh, um, it, it didn't come natural to me uh, coming into Burger King because at Unilever, everything was very well defined in terms of like, you were responsible for this, the other person's the other department is responsible for that and the other. So you just do your job and you try to do as best as you can. And then the other department takes it and does, do their job the best they can and it moves on. Um, at, uh, at Burger King, it was, um, you, you really need to bring people along in that process and by the way in Unilever too you know I just didn't do it as well because uh, it was not like a, a requirement you know what I'm saying uh, so coming into um, uh, Activision like uh, to me it's obvious that like uh, um, they, they have been so successful and like uh, and they're such a talented like pool of people that uh, I need to be super humble about um, the fact that I'm new to the industry and, and that I have a lot to learn. And that's one of the reasons why I came, by the way, um, and, uh, and, and bring people along on the, the eventual experiments and adjustments that I, I want to try. You know, like, uh, um, I think that's kind of like um, one of the key things and one of the things I probably spend most of my time um, it's funny because people think like, oh, you guys do these crazy ideas and fun stuff and cool things. And they think that I spend most of my time doing that. Uh, but actually, I spend most of my time like, uh, um, like finding talent, nurturing talent, like uh, um, uh, convincing people, setting a vision and, and bringing people together and building bridges between departments. You know, like uh, the day-to-day -day is actually very different than what some people think it is. It's still a cool job, don't get me wrong. <laughs> no, it's fun. Like, I can't complain. Like, uh, like I still pinch myself thinking that I, I work with video Right, games. right. Um, I guess, you know, you've only been here, uh, you've been here for six months. I bet you if I asked you the same question a year, a year and a half from now, it would be, it might, it probably will be different. But can you give us some pointers of somebody that's, a, if there are brands out there that are trying to get into the gaming space, what are the do's and the don'ts of, of uh, uh, from a best practices that you would want to um, you would you would advise them to do yeah I, I see so much opportunity you know like uh, we were trying to do that with Burger King and Popeyes you know like uh, historically way before my time Burger King already played around gaming 
you know, like uh, they had, I think in 2009, like uh, the, the best sold game of the year for Xbox in terms of units sold with the Kings games, like uh, that was a pretty from Crisp Porter back then. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think the key thing to me is you need to really understand the game uh, and the community of players, you know, like uh, don't assume anything. Like uh, uh, you, you need to have people in the team that play the game, you know, for years and like they know like what is right, what's wrong. And they know like uh, how people are going to feel if you do certain things, you know, like no one who is playing a game is desperate waiting to, to, to see your ad, you know, like, uh, or to see your brand. That's not the reason why they are there. So if you come as an interruption without adding value to, uh, to those players in a way that is meaningful to them, it will probably have the opposite effect of the one uh, uh, you are looking for. I think that maybe some people who don't play the game may find it cool and like, oh, how cool this brand doing gaming stuff. They are younger and this and that. But for the player, like, uh, like they will crucify you, you know, like uh, if you... And they're uh, vocal. They're very vocal. They are. Like, yeah, they are. They're very vocal in social, like Reddit, Twitter, you know, like, um, um, so I strongly recommend that you understand the game inside and out and that like you find a way that will add value to the, to the player and then, and then you'll be welcome to that party. Well, I have to tell you, having uh, three kids, two of them being teenagers, Call of Duty is um, being used here way too many times, too much to be honest. <laughs> and I tell you, Vanguard is, I didn't know how to say it other than wow. So it's, it's uh, it really, really is amazing. The footage is, it's just incredible. It really is incredible. You feel like you're, you're you feel like you're there. Um, but it speaks for, it speaks for the, the, the talent that we have in the studios, you know, like it's really, really amazing. Like I have meetings where we are discussing like what's coming next year or be even beyond. And it's just like, if you like the space, which I love, like, it's like, oh my God, like, uh, it's amazing, you know, like, uh, uh, the caliber of people that work in the studios, in the, in the, in the product team is like, it, 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 there is no, it's not an accident that it looks so great. No, and I, I have to tell you, like, I'm originally from the Middle East and, you know, there was this footage, even in the video that was previously here, where it said in Lebanon and in the city of Tripoli and then moving to Jordan. These are, if you look at the footage, it is real. It is, um, it, it's not, it's not just animated made up stuff. It looks like you're there and having been there myself and been born and raised there, it's, this is not, um, it's not real, it's, it's reality. That's what's, it's so yeah. impressive about it. It's blurring the lines, right? Yeah, yeah, no, he says, what do you think is next for gaming? Um, if you were to think out two to three years from now, where, where does this industry go? Um, it's a good question. I think that like, I think it will continue to evolve in some of the vectors that we are seeing now, because uh, I think there is so much still like potential for maximization of some of that, you know, like I think it will become even more social. I think it will become even more broad. Um, I think that brands will uh, understand even more that they are like an always on platform and they need to make great engaging things happen live uh, for people to be coming back. It's like, imagine like, um, I don't know if you watched that movie, like Ready Player One, you know, like uh, it's, it's kind of like that, you know? Uh, uh, and um, uh, I, I see it become even more mainstream. I see mobile growing a lot, you know, like I grew up in Brazil, not everyone in Brazil has, uh, can afford a PlayStation 5 or a PC to play. But everyone has a cell phone uh, and a smartphone. So uh, that will also, I think, grow a lot in terms of becoming an even bigger platform for people to play. Uh, not just because it's easy and you can play everywhere, but also because it demolishes one of the key barriers uh, for people, which is not having a console or a PC. Uh, people who play World of Warcraft or play um, Call of Duty on a PC, it's usually it's a pimped. PC, it's, like, it's, it's not cheap, you know, like, uh, uh, so if you can play on a phone that you already have, um, that becomes much more accessible. So I see that growing a lot, propelled by uh, developing emerging markets like Brazil, like India, like China, 
Um, so I, two, three years, I think it'll be even bigger, you know, like. Uh, yeah, it's a massive global opportunity for sure. I guess selfishly, and before we open it up to, um, to some questions, I just want to be considerate of everyone's time, is having uh, being, uh, being in the o TV OEM space and the connected TV space within LG, how do you see to from a uh, how do you see gaming reaching gaming audiences and look uh, and, and helping you guys um, in for the as as part of the the OEM channel and where do you see the OEMs playing within the gaming just nothing to do with yeah. LG but just in general yeah I, I see, look I mean I think that in the case of gaming like uh, everyone. Like the, usually the background of people working in gaming and management, not in the studio, uh, it's probably coming from most people would dare to say have an experience either in entertainment or in some sort of digital tech uh, uh, background. You know, um, because of that, uh, there is a very strong and, and, and like in most of the investment that Historica has been done has been be behind performance marketing, yeah? So there is a, a strong tendency for people to obviously put a lot of premium in terms of channels that we can measure the ROI, you know, like in, in even more so than on my life at CPG or even more so than my life on, on QSR. Uh, because of like the previous experience then that people have. My boss comes from Google. You know, like, so he knows uh, the, the value uh, of that. Uh, so for me is like, uh, uh, is we lean into that very strongly because it, it's a much better uh, and more efficient way to see what we're getting for, for the investment we are making. You know, like uh, uh, it's much easier uh, to track, especially in the case of gaming. Um, because we, we control most of the channels. If not, we are very close. Um, so that's kind of like how I see it. Yeah, and it fits perfectly, especially with the global uh, footprint, right? So yeah. when you look at these big OEMs like LG, Samsung, and others, you know, um, the stat out there is one in every two TVs bought globally is either an LG or Samsung. So yeah. um, the fact that that is, you know, if you're going and expanding in India and Brazil and others, this, this fits, uh, fits perfectly. You know, I, I asked, I wanted to, I wanted to leave some, just some time. I really appreciate Fernando, your time, but wanted to see if there's any questions in the audience and um, let them, uh, let them pick up. I know they, we wanted to do a quick uh, cutoff around 1140, 1145. So I just want to be considerate of time. Um, I don't know if the folks at Brand Innovators, if you can see if there's any questions and um, if not, we'll, we can, um, we can definitely uh, ask a few more questions from Fernando. I think there was one question on the chat, which was, do you consider yourself a media platform for monetization uh, or a brand? I like, I see it as a brand, you know, like, uh, and then you have like different ways to monetize. You can monetize microtransactions. If you have like a, a free to play, uh, you can monetize by selling the box, which is kind of like the premium game that we sell, which is not really a box anymore. Like uh, you just download, uh, uh, or you can, you can monetize by, um, by through partnerships, through uh, using your game as a channel uh, for advertising, you know what I mean? Like, uh, um, to me, like uh, whether you are a media platform or a brand is not really apples to apples because it's a brand that has different ways to monetize. Yep, yep. I'm still waiting. Listen, there's some amazing content out there that's coming. I'm still waiting for you guys to get into that space. Um, you know, look at the popularity of Squid Game on Netflix recently. I am I am convinced that you guys or somebody else is going to come up with a version of Squid Game anytime soon. So it'd be, that'd be incredible, to be honest. Um, it's, a, it's a really fun series. It's a, it's, it's crazy. Um, there's another um, question that just popped up is, how do you address brand safety, media quality concerns for advertisers that wanting to get into involved with gaming? Uh... How, uh, let me think, like, I think that de depends on like uh, what you mean by brand safety, right? Because I mean, I think that you can, you can uh, achieve 
a good degree of brand safety, depending on who you are partnering with, which title you're partnering with, and, uh, and making sure that uh, your, your brand appears on the light that that you, you would like to, to have. You know, like I think that uh, I would also think about what audience you are trying to reach. You know, like uh, uh, we have all the data about who we are reaching uh, uh, on a daily basis. So depending on who your target audience is, we will, if you were to partner, we would recommend, oh, maybe this title, maybe that other title. And, uh, um, um, and then have a more like double click on the discussion in terms of like where your brand would appear. Uh, but I think it's much easier to control uh, than like, uh, than maybe on YouTube or like, uh, you know, like it's, uh, it's hard to compare, but- You have a lot more control here. You know exactly who's playing. You have yeah. a lot of, yeah. So no, I completely agree, especially from a brand safety perspective. Another question is that just came up is, does Activision have a preferred advertising platform when it comes to brand marketing or does it depend on the initiative, digital, TV, out of home, et cetera? I think like it, it depends a little bit on the initiative, but um, um, because our product is like a, a digital product, like uh, we have us historically, uh, we invested a lot in performance marketing, which is digital, uh, basically. But for instance, I'm talking to you for like my hotel is like in Times Square here in New York, like literally outside there is a massive like a, a Call of Duty Vanguard billboard, you know, like, uh, uh, so we do, we do do out of home. We have TV on air at the moment uh, 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 in terms of like a Call of Duty Vanguard, just to, to give an example, but most of the investment goes in, uh, in performance marketing digital today. Yeah. No, and it's, you're trying, and it's also based on the audiences that you're trying to reach for yeah. sure. For yeah, sure. It's, it's much closer to the path to purchase, right? Yeah, no, for sure. Well, hey, I think that's all we had. I wanted, I know we wanted, I really appreciate your time. And um, again, amazing, amazing work only in such a short time period and looking forward to see what you guys do next. And um, all I know for sure, this household of mine is going to be playing Vanguard for sure. <laughs> in a couple of weeks for sure. So Look, thanks, for, thanks for the, for the opportunity. Thanks for the, for the conversation. Uh, I hope people enjoyed uh, the presentation. I hope to be back soon uh, with Brand Innovators. Thank you so much. And thanks, Brandon Innovators. Appreciate it. I didn't know much about no. um, As we continue our morning, it brings me great pleasure to welcome Sahar Scott, VP of Global Marketing at Bumble to the event. Over the last two decades, Sahar has helped build and scale global brands and in startups, including Snapchat and Apple. She joined Bumble as Vice President of Global Marketing.